Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasahami um, So, uh, Ajahn Nisbo and I, um, I've been up here in Seattle now for a bit over a month and for the first month, so for most of June, Ajahn Nisbo and I were going around and uh, visiting different communities. We visited Shravasti Abbey, which is a, a Tibetan nunnery uh, outside of Spokane. And then we went up and taught a, a retreat in Winthrop, which was hosted by the Cascade Hermitage. And uh, the theme of that retreat uh, was the Bojangas. The Bojangas, these are uh, seven factors, often translated as the uh, factors of awakening. Uh, the Bodhi Angas. So an Anga is a limb, like an arms or legs, or it's just a, a factor. And Bodhi, like Buddha, or like the Bodhi tree, uh, this means uh, the root is awakening. So that which uh, wakes us up from being asleep, wakes us up from, from dreaming. Um, so these are seven things to keep in mind to round out our meditation practice and to round out our, uh, our lives of practice. Uh, my dad gets, he's a psychiatrist, not so interested, oh, well, he's a little bit interested in Buddhism, uh, but he doesn't, I don't think he likes the word practice, because it seems like it has no meaning. It's like I'm, I'm using practice as a noun and as a verb, and maybe as an adjective, like in every other sentence when we're talking to each other, and it's just, he gets a little bit annoyed with it, but uh, when you start, coming to practice, when you come to uh, uh, a life where you see the efficacy of habit and you're giving more attention to uh, what you're doing with your mind and how you're speaking and uh, what you're doing with your body, then you see that life really is a, it's a practice. So, uh, and it's, it's not just a, like a monomodal, like unifocus. It's not just uh, one thing. Practice, meditation isn't just one thing. Uh, meditation isn't just about, about relaxing. Um, uh, and the Buddha gave this list of seven factors for awakening, seven factors for bodhi, uh, to really highlight that. It's seven things that we can pay attention to uh, to make sure our practice isn't brittle, uh, to make sure our practice isn't uh, fragile, to make sure our practice isn't, isn't precious, isn't precious. So this is something which um, you come to a monastery and you might... Uh, or you come to meditation and people are kind of looking for a really simple tactic. Just tell me how to, tell me how to meditate. Just tell me to focus on the breath in a particular way and that's, that's all I want. Um, but when you conceive of the extent of the Buddha's teachings or the possibility uh, of why you know, we came here, uh, the possibilities for meditation and a life well lived in such narrow terms, then your life becomes a little bit fragile. It's like you uh, you come to a monastery or and that's all you want to do is just sit down and watch the breath at the tip of your nose or you just got your place in your house. That's where your meditation cushion is and that's all practice is. And it's a very narrow conception of what uh, life can be like. It's a very narrow conception of the maturity which um, is pointed to in the Buddha's teachings. So we want to make our practice head in the direction of uh, being robust, being mature, mature uh, in the direction of what's called anti-fragility. So this is a, a concept. There's an author named Nassim Taleb. He wrote a book called Anti-Fragility. And there are certain systems which uh, really thrive off of adversity, thrive after, uh, you know, on being, being pushed. So there's something called... Wolf's Law in medicine, where uh, if you stress certain bones to a certain extent, then they'll actually get, get stronger. Uh, and there's definitely that in meditation. If we're uh, able to bring a more rounded sense of practice, bring uh, more than just a simple technique to practice, then our practice gets stronger. It's not just our meditation cushion, but it's our kitchen, and it's our living room, and it's our bedroom. Um, it's not just the five, ten, half an hour, hour that we can put into practice, but it's 
uh, the two hours in the morning and it's the afternoon and it becomes our whole life. Um, and yeah, heading, heading in this direction. So uh, these seven factors are, uh, just list them. So we've got mindfulness, which is the first. The second is investigation. The third is energy. The fourth is joy. The fifth is tranquility. The sixth is concentration or collectedness. And the seventh is equanimity. Um, and mindfulness is always useful. That's the first one. The Buddha said mindfulness is always useful. Uh, the next three, so investigation, joy, uh, investigation, energy, and joy are activating qualities which bring uh, a sense of energy into our practice when that's what we need. And the last three are calming factors. So they bring some level of, uh, of downward moving uh, energy, some uh, settling when that's what we need. So one way to memorize these seven, uh, there are a number of ways. Uh, one which we've talked about on that Bojanga retreat um, and which we might mention today is the Bojanga jangle, which is a full embodied method for remembering these techniques which involves standing up and it's almost like yoga techniques, it's almost a dance and we might not do that this morning. Um, but what we will do is a way to remember these, an embodied mnemonic or uh, meditation or memory technique called the Bojanga jingle. So this is just, you don't have to stand up, it's just one hand, whatever hand, left hand, right hand, the Bojanga jingle. So we've got seven factors. The first factor is like the wrist. This is uh, mindfulness. And this is the, the hinge of our practice. And it can be said, if you know how to be mindful, then everything is practice. If you know how to be mindful, to flex that wrist, then everything is practice. And if you don't have that flexibility, if you don't know how to be mindful, then nothing is practice. So this is the hinge of practice. The next factor is the palm, that which lifts things up and, and looks at them. This is investigation. This is the palm of our practice. We, we lift up a factor in our mind. If the, we look at our mind when we come to sit, what's going on? And we look at it. The next factor is the thumbs up. This is energy. This is what strikes the, the lighter. This is what turns the, the level up on the volume. You need more volume, this is energy. The next is the index finger, which pushes up the smile. This is, this is joy. This is what kind of conducts the whole uh, enjoyable aspect of, of practice, the, uh, yeah, the enjoyability of practice. The next is the middle finger. And this is what, if you're stroking a, a cat, you're petting your cat, what contacts first is the middle finger. This is tranquility, the tranquility of practice, the middle finger. Then you have the ring finger, that which symbolizes marriage. This is when we bring the practice together, collect our practice, the ring finger of concentration, of collectedness, of grounding. And then you've got your pinky of equanimity, and you might have to figure it out for yourself how that relates to equanimity. It's just something that rounds things out. Um, and maybe by the end of the talk, we'll be able to figure that out. But uh, the pinky finger, like drinking tea, tea um, of practice. So uh, just introducing like that, and Ajahn Nisibo and I will take turns um, speaking to each of those factors. I think that jingle was literally come up with in the last few minutes, or on the fly, it was impressive. <laughs> so. And I do think by the end of this, we'll get some Bojanga jangle as well in there. Um, so yeah, we wanted to bring back uh, the retreat we did on the seven factors to people here just by doing a bit of tag team back and forth. Um, and the first uh, factor of mindfulness, which Ajahn Kovila spoke to, or sati in Pali, uh, is the, it's related to the root sar, which means to remember. And generally, it uh, can be seen, there's three sorts of awareness that are commonly spoken of. There's spotlight awareness, which focuses on one object. There's temporal awareness, which is aware of all phenomena uh, in a present moment. So it's temporally focused. It's based uh, in a moment of time, but receiving all stimulus within that moment. 
And then there's metta awareness, M-E-T-A. And that's deciding where to point our awareness. This is the director. So this is mindfulness, this is sati, is remembering to remember in one way of thinking about it. And this allows us to figure out how to balance our, uh, our practice. Um, I think one of the best uh, analogies of mindfulness is, is trying to look after a toddler, actually. So maybe the mind is running around here and there in its joyful way. Hello. <laughs> and that's great. That's what minds do. And it's sweet, and we don't have to be averse at all. But you do have to make sure that a uh, toddler doesn't get uh, run off into the street or uh, disconnect all the AV equipment or anything like that. <laughs> and this is the calming aspect of mindfulness. When we know the mind is agitated, then we know to bring to bear the three uh, calming awakening factors. Do people remember what they are? We have equanimity, T. We have concentration, and we have the uh, Upeka, or the uh, pasadi, the tranquility of petting the cat, the middle finger. And um, the, uh, or maybe the child is uh, quite tired and falling asleep, in which case there's a place for applying the enlivening factors of investigation, good, energy, okay, that's the lighter, and we have the uh, joy. All right, I, I should be able to remember that one. And just uh, deciding where we want to focus the meditation. And it's sloth and torpor creep into meditation in a very subtle way where maybe we aren't becoming explicitly tired, but things just get fuzzy. And to this is, means mindfulness has slipped. And to really bring a clarity to experience, uh, if you're with the breath, you can really focus in on this place where you feel the breath the most not imagining something there, but just being very sensitive to the sensations at that space. And uh, Jnana Ponika talks about four functions of mindfulness, which I think are really helpful to keep in mind uh, or in our practice. One is to tidy up by naming. So this is that simple act of seeing um, what's in the mind and getting a chance just to name it. And there's a huge calming effect when we do that. We, uh, often in a meditation, you might be trying to come back to a certain object, but a hindrance or a difficulty or a, something continues to come up. And just making that the object of your awareness for a time and just naming it doubt, restlessness, sloth, anger. There can be huge release in that. And uh, the second is non-coercive procedure, which is often the fact that simply by knowing something, by letting it exist in a certain amount of spacious awareness, it resolves itself. Um, it's like the mind is a bunch of kids playing under the staircase, and often you don't have to do anything. You just open the door and have the parent turn on the light and just look at the kids and say, carry on, and see how long they carry on for, or if they quiet down really fast. There's slowing down, which is the third function, and then there's directness of vision, which is seeing clearly. What mindfulness also does is it relates experience to a framework, a dharmic framework. And very often, this is the key, because what keeps us from being mindful and present isn't the happiness in our lives. We're, well, sometimes we can get lost in that, but we're pretty open to being happy. It's the suffering. It's the thing that we're running from or thinking shouldn't be like this, and therefore it's the thing we're negotiating how to escape from or the argument we think we could have had better or are going to have better. So this is the important of, importance of what we did at the beginning of the meditation, of bringing to mind that thing that is that thread of dukkha for you and trying to orient towards it with a dharmic view uh, seeing the fact that it is impermanent, seeing the fact that this is the nature of the world, seeing the fact that this is teaching you to be more compassionate and patience, patient, and you can feel the clicking into place when mindfulness is correctly applied in that way, 
and an experience is connected to a dharmic vision and suddenly the suffering is gone and there's a real sense of settling. So this is one of the most important functions of mindfulness is bringing to bear the right tool of contemplation to release craving and therefore dukkha. And the Buddha said in one sutta that when mindfulness is developed, then it leads to the next factor, which is uh, investigation, dhamma vichya. And the Buddha did speak about these seven as a ladder. So when dhamma vichya or investigation is cultivated, it leads to energy. When energy is cultivated, it leads to joy. When joy is cultivated, it leads to tranquility and concentration and equanimity. He did talk about it as uh, sequential steps, but he also talked about it as like a pocket knife. It's like you can use these things at different times for different purposes. Um, so it's not one or the other, it's, it's both. Um, but I think the way Ajahn Nisbo was talking about mindfulness really does lead right into this Dhammavichya investigation. Uh, this is the, the question mark of, of practice, or you can think about it as the, the cook. This is the, the chef of practice. It looks at the mind, it looks at our life and sees what ingredients are present and how we can make a good meal out of it. It's curiosity. Um, someone during the retreat asked a great question. So investigation, um, what's the difference between that and just thinking about something? Uh, and I think uh, it's a great question. And the difference is that Dhammavichya is disciplined curiosity. So it's disciplined and specific curiosity. So it's not just uh, following any thought that comes up, but it's seeing which, which thoughts, paying attention, having the mindfulness to know what thoughts are coming up and which thoughts would be helpful to cultivate and which thoughts would be helpful to let aside. There's a, uh, there's a, a structure, there's an overarching purpose leading towards awakening. What's going to lead towards awakening and then nurturing the thought processes or even just the inclinations. This can be a huge question mark Dhammavichya encompasses the huge questions of our life when you're thinking about uh, a change of occupation, running the cost-benefit analysis, doing the, pro, the pros and the cons, writing it out. That is a level of Dhammavichya. But it goes all the way down from that huge, almost cartoonish exclamation point slash question mark all the way down to just a slight raising of your you know, voice at the end of a, a, a question, at the end of a, a statement. It was Really? Really? Or like, hmm? Just, and that's, that's the, when Dhammavichya comes in to be a factor of, of jhana or absorption. It's, there is, a fa there is a place for directed thought and evaluation in the first jhana, in these very absorptive uh, meditative states. But it's just this, the most quiet curiosity, the, the most uh, still and settled questioning. So Dhammavichya serves that, that full role. On the retreat, we were comparing each of these to vegetables because we were holding it above a food co-op. Do you remember what uh, pity, joy was, or, or uh, effort, wiria? Jalapeno, pepper. Jalapeno peppers. <laughs> All right. So um, the next factor is effort, uh, wiria. And there are ways of talking about this which are... Um, quite familiar to people uh, in terms of bringing to mind the uh, necessity of practice, the preciousness of this moment we have, how rare it is to encounter the Buddha's teachings, to be interested in them, to have the chance to practice, and making much of that. But for moderns, the word effort is so fraught that often there's really a space for leaning into a more holistic vision of what it means to touch effort correctly. And uh, there's a term, diligent effortlessness, which I think is quite good, or a grace of movement. And that's not to say there isn't a place for applying strong effort but often in our lives, that effort is actually most effectively applied 
to the act of uh, waiting and restraint. The Four Noble Truths come as they do, or at least one way we can think about them, these four tasks of comprehending suffering, letting go of its, craze, cra its cause, craving, realizing cessation, peace, and then developing the path, is we have to find peace, the third truth, before we can see f the fourth of the path clearly. So often, our effort is just holding still through the storm of doubt, of anger, of greed, of thinking we have to come to a decision right now. Just restrain yourself. Don't say the thing you know you shouldn't say. Don't act too quickly. You're okay. Things don't have to change right now. And it can take real effort to hold still. But if you manage to do that, and you know they call meditation sitting in the fire, if you allow that kind of fire of defilement and of impatience to burn over you and pass by you. And this is why the Buddha said patient endurance is a supreme incinerator of defilement. You do find that on the other side there's a sense of peace, a quiet majesty, and a clarity about exactly what you should do. And then effort, effort is simple. You know, okay, I need to make a change now. There needs to be something that shifts. Someone was just talking about how she heard a teaching which really made it clear to her that her career, something needed to change. And just in that knowledge, there was a huge release. But it didn't come from the place of doubt and suffering. It came from the quiet after. So, so much of right effort for us moderns is the effort of holding still long enough under the tree for something to drop into your hand or a butterfly to land on you. Uh, it's the effort of turning a key rather than shouldering open a door. And just to have faith, um, and to have faith that when you're sitting in the fire, as you're applying that effort to not act too quickly, having faith that um, that heat of burning off that old karma of impatience has a humbling and powerful effect on you. And it, it is the heat that the Dharma applies to the crucible of our life, and it would only apply it in measure to the instrument of care that it wants to make you into, to use a personified term. So this is one way of looking at right effort, which I think is really helpful. And when that effort matures and develops, uh, when it's developed, it leads to this joy. So the fire, we've turned on the lit the fire, and now we can dance by the fire in that way that people used to dance in the 1920s. Um, <laughs> The, the index finger, and uh, Pali has a lot of words for joy. People come to Buddhism, and first they're inspired because you heard about the Dalai Lama and Thich Nhat Hanh, but then you learn that the first truth, the first noble truth, is suffering. <laughs> and it's like, that's a downer. And then there's just so much talk about suffering, uh, but there's so much talk about joy as well. There's so many words for joy in, in Pali. And uh, the word that's used in these seven factors is piti. And uh, the root of that is related to, to drink or to be nourished or be, to be refreshed. So this is the refreshing aspect of, of meditation when you're sitting and you're mindful, you're alert, but actually uh, to sustain that over a life and to be something you want to do, actually nurturing this joy actually uh, giving rise to some sense of well-being, can you actually turn, turn that on a bit uh, and incline and lean into it and say, is, where, where is joy actually right now? And that's something which might actually make you want to meditate, not out of duty, but because it's, it's fun and enjoyable and it's, it's making you a more happy person. Um, so this is joy. This is the f one word for uh, joy in Pali, piti, the refreshment, the uplift. But another one is uh, mood, so as in pamoja or mudita, this is uh, a type of joy which is, mood means soft. So the type of joy in Buddhism that we're inclining towards is a refreshing joy, the piti, but it's also a soft joy, the mudita. And being able to lean into both of those types of, of well-being will really round out and uh, mature our practice.
Did we Joy was watermelon. Was that it? Oh, right. Good. What was uh, Pasadi and Samadhi? Celery. celery. All right. We couldn't think of a better one. So celery is the next. Um, so this is tranquility, and we're going to group that with uh, concentration or unification of mind, Samadhi, because we don't have that long. Um, and there's two of us and seven factors, so we had to squish two. Um, perhaps what's most important to note here is Pasadi, uh, tranquility, the middle finger that strokes the cat or calms, is a term really closely linked to the body, tranquility of body and mind. And it's just really important to realize that to meditate in a comfortable way, you first need to find a way to re-inhabit and calm the body. Um, and that really can mean exercise before you meditate. Uh, do some qigong, take a cold shower, whatever works, but don't make the mistake of thinking going straight to the cushion is necessarily the best way to get to a deep state. Um, calm the body first. Um, and it's also the importance, and this goes along with the next factor of samadhi, unification of mind, of finding a way to re-inhabit the body in meditation. And these are where body scan techniques such as Goenka teaches, such as Ajahn Tanisro has translated from Ajahn Lee in his book, Keeping the Breath in Mind, Method 1 and Method 2. If you haven't looked those up, they're on dhammatalks.org, but basically involve uh, placing awareness at different points in the body as you breathe and just feeling the resonance there and the sensations or sweeping the awareness through the body with the breath. And the one of the great uh, difficulties with how samadhi has been translated and taught in the West is that it's been taught as concentration on one point, where he's a real active, engaged, and uh, enduring samadhi practice really requires us to find a way to make it interesting. And that requires often a practice which is robust, uh, where you have a wide toolkit. And that's uh, an important thing to keep in mind with samadhi, is usually, like Ajahn Kovilo spoke of in his talk last week, you want a dhamma combo of uh, at least two different objects which can alternate or pair. Breath, loving kindness. Breath, uh, sound of silence. A mantra and something else. Um, but find a way to make practice interesting. And if it's lost that feel, then it's really worth reading a few books by authors a bit different than the ones you've read before. If you're interested in different ways of looking at the breath, read an Ajahn Brahm book, read Shaila Catherine, and often that will be enough to reinvigorate your practice with interest. And when we cultivate this tranquility and the collectedness or concentration, then it leads to uh, the last factor, which is equanimity. And uh, one thing which is reassuring, um, you know, being uh, more frequently now, kind of being up in front of people, talking about uh, various different Dhamma points, is um, that really, um, I think this is a good recollection, is that um, even if you don't like what the Dhamma talk is about, uh, or you don't like the speaker's voice or whatever, it's almost, it's better that way because, well, it's, be well, it's, uh, it's, it's good in its own way in that it's great training for being off the cushion. You're going to meet people who you don't like and whose voices you don't like and whose ideas are uh, annoying. Um, so, yeah, you can just... Uh, yeah, holding Dhamma talks in that way kind of is uh, refreshing for the person giving the Dhamma talk because, uh, yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> but in general, yeah, just saying that because some people really do, yeah, the simpler the better, you know, uh, with, with meditation. They're like, seven things? Come on, seven? I mean, that's, that's a lot to be keeping track of. Um, but equanimity, you know, having a sense of balance uh, on these things, the pinky, you know, that which drinks tea and is able to just... Um, yeah, sit, sit with things and uh, walk a tightrope. There was a great movie uh, at certain training monasteries. Uh, you know, we don't watch movies as, as monks, um, but at certain training monasteries, just to give a little bit of a steam valve for uh, people who are addicted to watching movies, once a year there's a movie night. And I remember I was staying at a training monastery uh, during, it was when I was a novice, and the movie that they picked was Man on Wire, 
It's a, it's a documentary, a great documentary, about this French guy named uh, Philippe Petit, I think, and he was a tightrope walker and uh, who crossed from the first tower of the World Trade Center to the second tower of the World Trade Center in 1976. And equanimity is basically what keeps us on that wire. It's keeping mindful, the balance, the fulcrum point, and you know, using the, the crossbar of when things go too much in, in one direction, too, uh, too tranquil, too down, then you bring the other side up. And when, things, when that other side goes up, you bring that side down, and the other side goes up. And that's what equanimity is about, is just keeping this, this balance, staying on, on the wire. So those are the seven factors of awakening, and I hope everybody can keep those in mind and uh, really uh, explore them in your own practice to keep meditation alive, not and so, you, so you're not just a one-trick pony, because I think I gotta say it because it came up. Um, but in the circus of samsara, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're gonna want more than just a one-trick pony. It's not even that good of a line, but uh, <laughs> samsara is like a circus, and we do need more than just uh, one trick in our lives. So, yeah. Sadhu, 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 anumodami. It's two pony jokes in one month, Ajahn. I don't know if you get a third. Cut myself off for the year. Okay, so uh, yeah, we we are trying to make our talks a bit shorter, but we figured we were doubling up now, and so it's you know we did what we could. So. Um, we wanted to give people a chance to uh, just divide into breakout groups. Um, and uh, so if people could, and those on Zoom will get you in breakout rooms as well, uh, divide into groups of three or four with the people near you. And just with the discussion for 10 minutes, um, what's the enlightenment factor that you feel you need to work on the most in your life right now? And what's a way you can think of doing that? Um, we'll run a mic over to you, and uh, yeah, that too. <laughs> Raise your pinky today. And uh, if you say your name, and just um, either you can ask a question or just say what came up in the discussion together for the breakout groups. Just making sure the mic works. Testing, testing, testing. Okay. We have one over there. Sorry, he's far away. <laughs> Hello, testing. I'm Sam. I was discussion with Toby, and something that came up for me that I wanted to ask a question about and that we were discussing was simplicity in life being conducive to the first factor of mindfulness, or any of them really, where you know busy stuff comes up and you sort of can't help thinking about things that are important in your day. So the more simplified you are in your lifestyle, the easier it is to do all parts of it, maybe. <laughs> and I think y'all have gravitated towards simplicity in a certain way. <laughs> so, but there's also the fact where, or the vibe of, we're practicing this to be free from conditions. So it's like, why does simplicity have to be a condition? Maybe. So, yeah, not sure what the question is, but if there's a reflection on that, if that makes sense. Simplicity is great, and I admit I've had less of it over these last two years but in a good way, um, too. Because I, I think your point is well taken. Like, it is very useful to have uh, simplicity in times of simplicity in your life. Um, but being in contact with others and conflict and, uh, I mean, that's where we develop wisdom. So uh, Ajahn Amaro often compares practice to a knife and sharpening it. And if the angle of the knife is too shallow uh, and if there's too much seclusion, too much pulling away, uh, you could say almost too much simplicity in some ways. The, there's no sharpening that occurs, the angle's too shallow. Um, if there's too much contact, too much entanglement, the angle is too steep and it blunts the blade. And um, this is something I think you have to intuitively find yourself. But I think a really good metric is, you know, can you maintain mindfulness of the body in these situations 
uh, can you come into interactions and relationships with a sense of composure and centeredness? And you feel really clearly uh, when a relationship, when you don't have that center and when you're just feeding into old karma and it has your, its tentacles around you. And that's a sense that you're not doing anyone any good, um, probably. So that's really when I think you know, okay, the, the angle is too sharp. Um, and I think another useful metric is uh, just making sure that you've structured times of simplicity into your day when it's most important. Like, see if there's times when you it is really good for you to meditate um, and see if you can just schedule, you don't look at the phone for that period, and, and then you really can put aside everything else for that time and find a day that can be your uposa today, your Sabbath, once a week, and have that as a space where you, you hold and protect and care for as sacred. And that gives you a reference point for all the other madness because otherwise you don't know how sharp the angle with the blade is if you don't have any reference point for what, for what quiet is. So making sure you have some references in the day too. Oh, okay. I don't see there are, who's asking for the Oh, I don't think anyone was. Or, oh, Zoom, okay. A person on Zoom, whoever you are. Hi, can you hear me? I'm it's Kathy. Yes, yes, go for it. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I have been extremely distracted this morning because I'm multitasking and still trying to be with you guys because I was determined I was going to be here. Uh, the multitasking could not be helped. It affects other people helping. Um, so I've been, as you said earlier, sitting in a fire um, in and out of meditation. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you for that analogy because nobody ever talks about those things in meditation, or I shouldn't say nobody, but often it is not talked about the difficulties, the challenges of being a meditator, of being trying to be a serious meditator, and also just being a householder. So I just wanted to acknowledge that I do appreciate that you cover all aspects of the, the process of meditation. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And um, yeah, having some kind of grounding while things around you are, are swirling can be good. Uh, so I hope the, yeah, the talk was uh, served that function to some degree. Um, so yeah, glad you could, could tune in even if there were other things going on. Was there someone else on Zoom? Oh, hello. Hi, Ajahn. Great to see you. Um, Sunny's right here. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, in our breakout session chat, we were talking about PT and like sort of reaching those states in meditation where you have like this all, sort of all encompassing joy and this weightlessness and how it's so nice when you can get those states of meditation and instead of like the, oh, my legs are hurting, <laughs> like that, that sort of meditation and trying to find like a consistent path to those um, sort of positive states of meditation. And I was wondering uh, if you have any insights on like how to find that consistent path. <laughs> yeah, one is just, uh, it is possible um, when when it's possible. So meditation is a skill that you know you can get better at. And learning the conditions, you know, it's possible to uh, master jhana to um, learn how to manipulate or how to work with the conditions in your mind, so as to be able to really uh, repeatedly and reliably give rise to that joy. Uh, if the conditions are there for that in the moment. Um, for a lot of people, that's not their often regular uh, experience of meditation. Um, so knowing where you're at, and uh, if you are seeing it more and more frequently, paying attention to the causes 
uh, both internal and external, what you set up outside, what the conditions were, the time of day, uh, all the conditions that help support, give rise to that internal uh, sense of joy, what you did with your mind, how your meditation object, how you were relating to the object, the intensity with which you were coming back to the object, the friendliness with which you were doing all that. Um, that is important. And there's a point in our meditative lives where that's more and more what we're experiencing uh, and more and more we can reliably get to those. Uh, but I think for many, if not most people, um, it's few and far between when you fear experience the five types of PT or the five types of rapture, joy uh, that are talked about in the Visuddhi Magga of uh, joy which brings goosebumps or joy which is all pervading or joy which is like lightning strikes or joy which is like waves just rushing over your whole body. Um, these are somewhat rare states for most people. Uh, most people have never maybe even experience these, uh, they are possible, but just knowing uh, the extent of joy that you can't bring, it doesn't have to be, those are the fireworks of practice, but those aren't necessary for development uh, on the path. Um, in fact, when you start experiencing things like that, uh, these exalting and exuberant um, states of, uh, of, of rapture even, uh, they're great, don't ignore them, but also don't give, they are, in a sense, they are the, the results of practice and they're the results of coming back to your, to your meditation object uh, in large measure. So really noting them, but coming back and giving attention and uh, emphasis to your main object and falling in love with that. And then when the, uh, the rapture comes, it comes. Um, that I think for most people, that's a, a healthy way to relate to these things.